All right, of course, a little short video there, of course, on Marie Antoinette. Uh, of course, tragic queen. Um, of course, later died on the guillotine. Uh, we'll talk, of course, more about her, of course, later today. So anyway, I want to welcome you back, of course, uh, to History 1123, uh, Batteries Community College, of course. I um, want to, of course, uh, talk about a few things before we get started. It looks like we do have a few students watching right now. Uh, looks like David and Christina watching again, of course. Good morning. Hope you're doing great out there, everybody. Hope you all had a good weekend, by the way, uh, overall. Uh, Emily looks like she's watching today, looks like also uh, as well. So uh, if anybody else is out there, let me know, uh, of course, later. But um, so anyway, yeah, uh, kind of today, as you know, I'm going to be talking about the French Revolution, of course, how it fundamentally <laughs> changed France a lot, pretty much overnight, uh, which it would. Uh, but it also changed uh, Europe, like modern Europe kind of changed a lot took a while, you know, uh, to actually happen, but that's something that will, of course, change. This will be part of a two-part lecture series, by the way, uh, that I will be doing, of course, on the French Revolution. I'll probably talk about mostly the cause of the French Revolution and maybe how it breaks out. And then, of course, later in the week, I'll kind of get into like the major events of the French Revolution. And, of course, we will get to the rise of Napoleon eventually, maybe this week as well, or maybe next week uh, also as well. So uh, right now, of course, uh, for our class, we have like a few assignments uh, which you need to kind of look at right now. Uh, don't forget, second vocab is due at the end of the week, Friday. I think it's March 19th. <clears throat> so make sure you kind of, uh, you know, turn that in. I think I told you before in a, a number, numerous announcements about that, about the assignment that just uploaded to the speed grader course uh, in Canvas uh, to turn in. Also, that quiz on the history of Britain, uh, that, of course, is also uh, due this week. I think it's Thursday. I might give you another day on it or something, maybe by Friday at the most. I'll give you a few days on it, but that's coming to an end. So try to wrap that up uh, also as well. Hey, Hope, good morning. How are you doing out there uh, overall? So uh, anyway, um, so yeah, I think that's our main announcements uh, right now. I don't have two other, I don't think any other announcements that are really big uh, right now uh, overall about the class. We're not really that close to like an exam yet. So we'll, we'll eventually get to that maybe in a couple weeks. So, all right. So uh, anyway, um, so yeah, today, like I said, I'm going to, of course, talk about the French Revolution uh, today, uh, kind of just get more into like the background, of course, uh, of the revolution uh, most of the talk about the background, talk about the outbreak of it, how it kind of starts uh, in France, primarily going into like the causes of the French Revolution. That's going to be the main thing we'll kind of get into because French Revolution is kind of um, complicated, uh, like especially compared to, say, the American Revolution, which I think was mostly about taxes and things like that. French Revolution had all, all kinds of problems and causes of why it kind of broke out uh, more or less. Uh, by the way, if you uh, have any comments, questions during the um, lecture, let me know, or of course later, of course during the live stream, or after the live stream, really, if you have any questions later, of course you can leave some kind of comments, questions about this lecture on my, my channel. Uh, here is the link if anybody wants to join me, by the way, in StreamYard.com. I don't know if anybody does, but there's the link right there if you want to join me. All right, so uh, yeah, what was the French Revolution? And of course, there's all kinds of definitions I guess you could kind of give uh, for that. Uh, primarily, it was this social uh, political revolution that broke out uh, in, revol uh, in France, which lasted about 10 years. Uh, it also, not just that, but it also, it spread to the continental Europe. You know, it was like it spawned, like, if you know about this wars, like the French Revolutionary Wars that would kind of follow afterwards that they would have. I think it started in 1792. And, of course, I overthrew absolutism, got rid of, like, the French Bourbons, like, in their regime, uh, and it put in, like, more democratic reforms uh, in the country. And um, the French Revolution, like I told you before, influenced a lot of people. It influenced other countries to, you know, revolt. I think it, they say it affected the Latin American revolutions along with the rise of Napoleon uh, also as well. 
Obviously, the rise of the revolution allowed Napoleon to seize power because Napoleon came from like a lesser background. I think I think he's like really non-nobility uh, pretty much. Uh, and so it enabled him to rise to power like through the military uh, and eventually seize power in 1799. So that is one of the results, I guess, of the aftermath of the French Revolution. But the revolution actually kept going. Um, of course, it lasts about 10 years, but they have like other revolutions that follow in France uh, in the 1800s that keep keep going because they put the monarchy back in, if you know about that, later on. Of course, Napoleon was kind of like a monarch. And then they had Louis the, I think it was 18th and Charles the 10th. And I think they had also Louis Philippe uh, the first, I think they had uh, were other kings. Uh, but um, eventually they'll get rid of it and just have a republic, which France has today, of course, now. Uh, of course, the revolution is, you know, notorious for violence. That's one thing we'll get to later. A uh, very, very violent revolution, uh, especially the reign of terror, where they killed a lot of people that were opposed to the, you know, reforms and all that. We'll get to like Maximilian Robespierre and the Jacobin, Jacobins and all that. Uh, they, of course, were the ones that really kind of start all that. But I'll get to it later. Yeah, the revolution does, you know, influence. It's like they, the French get rid of slavery eventually. Uh, they give, you know, voting to every all the males and eventually women, too, uh, get voting as well. Uh, quality to all men. That's another thing you see in the French Revolution. That's also important. Liberty, equality, fraternity is like the motto of the French Revolution. Ideas of nationalism, liberalism, socialism, communism even. Uh, were supposedly evolved from the French Revolution, of course, initially. So uh, let, let's get into, of course, and talk about, you know, what were some of the causes of the French Revolution? Well, the causes of the French Revolution uh, or, are extensive. Like I said, there's a lot of different reasons uh, of why uh, the French Revolution occurred. Uh, we'll get to, like, you know, the outbreak of it, which happens in 1789. But they think a lot of the causes kind of go back to not just Louis XVI's time, but before that. You can go all the way back to Louis the Fifteenth uh, and even Louis the Fourteenth of why the revolution occurred. Uh, I think a lot of people blame a lot of the wars that the French Empire got into. Uh, and that, they think, was part of the reason why the revolution happened later then, of course, we'll get into like the lack of equality, you know, among the lower classes. They don't have any rights, uh, political power, social power uh, in general. But uh, the revolution itself usually starts under uh, Louis the 16th. He was the fifth Bourbon king uh, who reigned from 1774 uh, to 1792. You can see he was the grandson of Louis the 15th, who was, by the way, in France called the Beloved. Uh, that king before that, who reigned, by the way, around almost 60 years uh, that he was in power. He was the great grandson of Louis XIV. And uh, they think under Louis XV, that's when the empire of the French Empire, their kingdom kind of starts to decline, uh, more or less, uh, at the time. Uh, they start even losing territory, I'll get to later, uh, like, say, during the Seven Years' War uh, and all that. Uh, a lot of historians blame Louis XVI. He was just a poor leader, poor leader, basically. He wasn't like really as absolutist as some of these other previous rulers they had before, like Louis XIV and Louis XV. I thought he was incompetent, indecisive. Uh, he preferred to kind of, you know, go with whatever his advisors wanted him to do. Uh, and he was kind of a, uh, what's the word to use? He was kind of this um, clumsy uh, idiot. I think some people kind of, kind of, kind of called him, I guess, like a schlub, I think one might be the good word to describe uh, Louis the Sixteenth. They don't. They, I don't think he really wanted to be king. Uh, uh, he wasn't really supposed to. I think his father was supposed to be the king, uh, and uh, he preferred to like play with locks. If you know about this, he was kind of this amateur locksmith, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, and so he really didn't want to be king. He was like a teenager when he became king. Uh, if you know about this. Uh, then, of course, if you know about it, he married um, eventually Marie Antoinette, uh, whose real name was, by the way, Maria Ant Antonia, uh, who came from Austria. Uh, she, of course, uh, this was all like a political marriage uh, between France and Austria uh, because of the diplomatic revolution that happened in Europe, uh, where Austria and France became allies. 
Uh, most of the French, though, didn't like the Habsburgs. I hated them uh, and the Austrians and saw them as enemies. And so uh, she was never popular in France. Uh, as you know, she was known for being kind of extravagant, um, you know, fancy hairdos, fancy balls, uh, and would just spend lavishly a lot of the money. Uh, and so a lot of people blamed her uh, for why France was kind of declining, uh, you know, in, in the eight, 18th century. Of course, you can see she was the daughter of Empress Maria Teresa. I think I've got another picture of her right here. She's a very beautiful woman, by the way, uh, Marie Antoinette. Uh, she came to France, I think, when she was 14 and married him. Um, I think, Louis, I think, uh, when I think they were, I want to say she was 16, I think, was he married him, I guess. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, um, the two really never, I don't know if the two really that close, really. Uh, as you know, like they said in the video, uh, the first few years, uh, they didn't actually consummate the marriage. Uh, the video was actually wrong. Uh, the real reason that uh, they had problems sexually was because Louis XVI had what they call phimosis, uh, which was this problem where you can't um, push your foreskin back. You know what that is if you're a man. Uh, and, um, and, that's, and so he couldn't have sex with her, basically. Uh, so uh, I think he had to have surgery or something like that. And then he was able to have kids with her after that. But that was supposedly the reason why they didn't have sex. You know, they wonder about that. So um, she had all kinds of names that the French called her, by the way. Uh, a lot of people call her the Austrian bitch, you know, about this. Yeah, it's kind of mean. Uh, Madame Deficit was also popular, too, because, like, they thought she was the cause of why France was in debt uh, when when they were in power. Uh, and uh, and so, um, as you know, um, they called her Madame Deficit <laughs> because of it. They also called her Madame Vito. That was another one later. It was popular too. Madame Vito. Uh, when I think Louis had this veto where he could veto like bills or acts uh, passed by, I guess, the French parliament later. And so they, they called it that because they thought she was the one that was influencing to veto like bills or whatever. Uh, La Trebade, which La, La Trebade means... Uh, the lesbian. <laughs> they blame, They thought she liked women instead of men, and <laughs> that was the reason why they didn't have any kids and all that. And so that was that was a German vice, lesbianism, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, but it was really Louis. That was the problem. Not. I think she was pretty hot, you know. Apparently, and um, she had like a lover on the side. Uh, they always talk about maybe the fact that she had some lovers. She had this lover named Hans Axel, who was. Count von Fersen, you may have heard of him. He was the Swedish, I think he was a Swedish ambassador or something like that. Uh, and I think he was madly in love with her. They, I think they were kind of in some kind of a love affair for like 30 years or something, they say. I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, that's kind of the story of Marie Antoinette. But she's like a tragic, tragic, tragic queen, you know, uh, what, of course, happened to her. Uh, did she say, let them eat cake later? They, of course, mentioned about that story about that, which has been attributed to Marie Antoinette when revolution was kind of breaking out and apply the peasants and all that. They don't not, they're not sure she ever said it, uh, but she may have been talking about brioche, which is a type of bread that's kind of fancy that a lot of the upper classes eat, you know, about that. We're out of bread. Just let them eat that instead. <laughs> that kind of thing. But they don't really know if she said it though. It's been debated. Uh, now there's this other thing they always talk about, which is famous in the French revolution that may have been a cause of why the, revolution occurred too, it was the so-called Little Ice Age. You may have heard about this so-called Little Ice Age. And it was this kind of climate change period uh, in uh, early modern Europe where uh, there was some kind of uh, change uh, in the climate, which where it got cooler. Uh, and, um, and so it caused like bad harvests to occur. Several famines, of course, took place uh, in France, which killed thousands uh, in so that's where the whole, I guess, the let him eat cake thing kind of is connected with that uh, pretty much. It was, it was popularized by this geologist in America named Francois Mathis in the 1930s. There have been a lot of books written about it, about the Little Ice Age, but there was cases where uh, it caused like, um, like in like, I think in England, like in London, where the, you know, the River Thames is, the river froze over, I think in the 17th century, uh, things like that. It's part of why the... Um, I think why the 
Swedes lost the Great Northern War against the Russians because the, the winter was just so bad uh, because of the Little Ice Age. So that may have been why Napoleon's forces got beat bad uh, in Russia because the, the winter was so bad. It was still around up to like the 1800s uh, overall. So, yeah, it's definitely considered one of the causes of, of why it happened. Why were the causes, though? There's all kinds of theories. Low solar output with the sun, volcanic eruptions like in Iceland and other places may have also caused it. Some people think it was caused by the change in the ocean's temperatures. So that may have been another reason for it. Earth's orbit being changed a little bit, maybe going you know further from the sun, uh, hard to say. They don't really know, uh, basically, but... Um, obviously, you know, a lot of people weren't happy because 26 million people mostly were peasants. So they were having to starve, you know, where while the king and queen live it up, like at Versailles, you know, with all the food and all that. Uh, and so you can understand why that's why everybody's mad, you know, with, with the king and queen and so on. Hey, Jessica, good morning out there. Hey, hope you're having a great morning this week. Uh, so uh, anyway, so that's the little ice age, which, you know, may have been a cause of, you know, why uh, the revolution, you know, took place more or less. Here's, of course, a picture showing like they say it happened right after the so-called medieval warm period, which I'll show you kind of a map right there on the right. But uh, it's kind of a cooling period. And then you can see after that, <laughs> you start seeing like because of they think because of the Industrial Revolution, the temperatures start going up, like warming up, you know, and all of that. So it's interesting about that. How well, temperatures have changed since going back to, you know, medieval times in general. So uh, anyway, um, so I'm next going to talk about, of course, other things. Of course, that was a major cause, also of why the revol revolution may have occurred. Uh, they also blame it on the Seven Years' War as well, uh, which happened uh, right before it, like roughly, I guess, about 10, 15 years before it. Uh, and uh, the Seven Years' War, if you know about it, uh, was a major world war. Uh, in fact, it was considered one of the first major world wars that was ever fought between the European powers. It was fought all over the world, uh, not just in Europe, uh, but the Americas, the Caribbean. They fought in India, like, like the British and the French to kind of control India uh, and all that. Uh, and what happened was the French suffered a lot of massive defeats in the war, especially in North America, where they lost all their North American, you know, colonies, uh, which they think that kind of played a role uh, in why, uh, you know, the, the French start declining and all that. You can see it lasted about seven years from 756 to 763, although the French and Indian War in North America started in 1754. So like really nine years in that part of it uh, overall. Uh, they believe the revolution was caused by the so-called diplomatic revolution that occurred in Europe. That's where the alliances switched in Europe, where Britain allied with the Prussians, uh, you know, Frederick the Great, because, you know, both are Germans. The Brit British were now ruled by the Hanover dynasty, which is in Germany. And Austria switched to the French side. Well, like you see the other states there, too, like Spain and Russia also came in and kind of backed them later. Uh, as well. They call it later the, the stately quadrille, which, by the way, is named after a dance that was real popular uh, in Europe called the quadrille. You may have heard of it, uh, where it involves like four different partners of dancers uh, that kind of switch the women back between them and all that. I guess the countries being switched back and forth are kind of like women, I guess. Uh, and so that's where you get the square dancing and all that. Have you ever done square dancing? Uh, the quadrille dance. So I call it the quadrille waltz. It's similar to it as well. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, so it, it that's what really caused it. It was actually started, well, there's two things that really started the conflict. They had the one in North America, they say, that started in 1754 first, uh, where what happened was the French and the British who were fighting over the fur trade, like around Canada and North America, got into a war like around Pennsylvania, where the Great Lakes are, they ended up fighting in Canada, and that later became known as the French and Indian War because they had both, side, both had like French allies that were far, fighting on both sides uh, in the war. So that was the initial, that part started that, that war. Then Frederick the Great got into war with Austria again, in the Holy Roman Empire, 
uh, because uh, Maria Teresa wanted Silesia back, which remember he had taken from her. Uh, and so um, they ended up in a war too. Uh, and next thing you know, Frederick's got to find an ally, a new ally, of course, to fight with. And so he backs the, he backs, you know, Britain. So Britain kind of is kind of allied with him. Uh, but Prussia actually gets invaded uh, by several countries, Russia, Sweden, uh, the French, Austria, almost pummel its country. By the way, almost overrun it, by the way, which he kind of survives, but uh, it didn't go well. But luckily, the, the ruler of Russia died, Empress Elizabeth. And that guy, Peter, that, that crazy guy, Peter III, came in. Remember him? The, uh, the husband of Catherine the Great came in. And he was like a fan of Frederick the Great. And so he, he like sued for peace. <laughs> so that's how Frederick survived, I guess, later. But anyway, um, but um, more importantly, going back to the French Revolution, the British launched a major campaign uh, into Canada, like bringing in more forces, more money uh, into it. Uh, and eventually what happened was it led to the fall of Quebec, which is you know, the capital of French Canada, New, New France. Uh, and in September, I think September 13th is the famous date, 1759, uh, Quebec fell uh, to the British so-called Battle of the Plains of Abraham, they sometimes called it. And so because of that, the French end up losing their North American colonies. So they have the so-called Treaty of Paris that they have later. I think I've got a picture showing that, like a map of the Treaty of Paris. You have a deal where you can see all the territory that the French had on the left, right, in blue. Well, they lost all of it. You don't see any left, do you? Well, pretty much it's all gone after that. So the French basically ceded all of Canada to the British Empire. They got the whole thing, of course, today. Of course, the French people are still there. Uh, we'll talk about them uh, as well. But um, And then the British also got Florida. Uh, the uh, If you know about it, Spain owned uh, Florida originally, but uh, the British wanted control of that whole East Coast. And so they did a swap, if you know about this. Uh, and so Louisiana went to the Spanish is what happened. And the British got Florida. And so the British at one point controlled all the territory you can see in Canada and all the land to the Mississippi River uh, also as well. So uh, you can, um, oh, what did the French have afterwards? Not much. The French, of course, ended up with pretty much just the Caribbean islands left, which Haiti or Santo Domingo uh, pretty much was the only area that was really left uh, afterwards. Of course, uh, and or oh, not Saint Domingo, I think it's called Saint Domain, is how they actually say it in French, really. I think that's the Spanish now, but um, they did have the expulsion of the Acadians, if you know about that. They were all kicked out uh, of like Nova Scotia, uh, in, in Acadia, and uh, so a lot of them ended up uh, fleeing and ended up in Louisiana, like where we are, uh, of course, often called the. the, the the Grand Derangement, uh, the, the the great deep deportation, I guess is kind of what that means. Uh, and so a lot of them, a lot of them came here uh, later and lived in Louisiana, which you know they had a lot of French people here uh, also as well. Some I think went back, uh, basically. But um, I have some relatives I think that are kind of related to Cajun French, but um, I'm mostly like on my mother's side. I think I'm primarily French Creole. Uh, that. Uh, came here directly from France in the 18th century sometime. So long time ago. So uh, anyway, um, that's pretty much what happened with that, you know, conflict, of course. Now, uh, the other thing that, uh, of course, was a major cause of why, you know, the revolution happened as well. You had this guy named George Washington. I've heard of him, right? Uh, you know, the so-called American Revolution that would, of course, would break out later. That's considered, of course, another cause, you know, of why the French Revolution actually happened, believe it or not. And that the revolution in America was caused by other things. It was mostly due to several things. Uh, one was the uh, high debts uh, that uh, were, were basically they were having to pay, uh, you know, to uh, pay off the it was because of the. Um, well, not the American Revolution. That's what's causes later, of course. That they get the French get involved because of that, but part of it was due to the fact that 
the um, the uh, in and the colonists had participated, like Washington himself had fought in the French and Indian War. And so they wanted them to pay the, the debts, you know, to pay off the, you know, all the debts that uh, Britain owed uh, from the French and Indian War, uh, of course. And so what ended up happening was the, the, the that's why the, the French end up supporting them because they're trying to get back at the British. They, they thought maybe they could get more prestige, maybe get more land back. Possibly, uh, they could defeat the defeat the uh, British in the war, uh, and so, like I said, the French supported the um, Americans in the in the American Revolution, but they ended up getting a lot of debt from it, which eventually ended up being one of the causes of why the French Revolution occurred, because uh, it almost put the French government in bankruptcy because of the amount of money that they spent on the war. I think I've got that later, but I'll talk about you know how much debt they owed, but it was some ridiculous amount uh, that they had. Uh, and um, they believe the American Revolution was caused by British uh, stringent mercan mercantile policies. There was no free trade yet because, uh, you know, Adam Smith had just written that book I told you about, The Wealth of Nations. Uh, and so they put these high taxes on the American colonists, like I told you, to pay off the French and Indian War, uh, like I told you. Uh, and uh, so that was definitely one of the, you know, reasons why it happened uh, and all that. So, yeah, uh, of course, they aided the Continental Congress, the Second Continental Congress uh, in the so-called Continental Army that would fight, of course, uh, against against the British uh, in the war. Uh, of course, the main army, the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army that, of course, fought the British was, of course, George Washington. You see there in the picture, uh, of course, was the first U.S. president later, the late late 18th century, when after the United States formed. Of course, America uh, declared its independence on July 4th, 1776, uh, when they broke away. And I talked about how Thomas Jefferson, of course, was famous, of course, for writing the Declaration of Independence, which was really a declaration of war uh, to, and, and not just, not just you know, becoming an independent state. Uh, several countries, of course, um, gave foreign support. I don't know if you know it, but the Dutch Republic was the first country that gave support to the United States, like actually recognized the U.S. as a separate country uh, in 1776. Uh, the French did too uh, by 1777, and so did the Spanish. They came in too uh, and supported the Americans uh, in the war. Uh, there were a lot of Europeans, by the way, that came over to fight for the American cause, like French Frenchmen like um, Marquis de Lafayette, you may have heard of, uh, you may have heard of like um, that guy, um, Kosciuszko, I think he was Polish, a uh, Polish soldier that came, I think it was, I think Kosciuszko was Polish, of course. Uh, Pulaski, I think was another guy, I thought he was, Pulaski I thought was Polish too as well. But, um, and then um, Baron von Steuben, remember him? Uh, he was a German uh, officer that came over and helped train Washington's forces uh, and all that. Uh, what happened was with French aid, the French army support, also naval support from the French with the American forces, they were able to eventually bottle up the uh, British forces in eastern Virginia at the Battle of Yorktown. This is in 1781. It was, a lot of it had to do with Marquis de Lafayette, uh, who was like a general that was under Washington's forces, and also with the French Navy. Uh, they were able to bottle up the British, and so it forced the British to basically sue for peace uh, and end the war with the Americans. Uh, what happened, of course, was they eventually was forced to recognize the United States uh, in the so-called Treaty of Paris uh, in 1783, uh, which you can see there. Uh, and um, uh, in that treaty, of course, it basically the, the British recognized the U.S., but not just that, it also recognized like what their territorial areas would be uh, as a country uh, right there. You can see the territory of the United States would go all the way to the Mississippi River, uh, except you can see the area of Florida is, was kind of disputed afterwards right there. Um, pretty much the Spanish end up with Florida, and the British end up keeping pretty much all of Canada uh, right there. French didn't really get much out of it, though. Uh, maybe some islands here and there in the Caribbean or something like that. 
uh, but uh, they pretty much didn't get any territory back uh, like they wanted, uh, like in Canada. So that was the only thing about that, uh, with, with what happened with the American, American Revolution in general. But they do think that the American Revolution was a cause of the French Revolution because a lot of French soldiers like Marquis de Lafayette went over you know, to America. They realized what they were fighting for, and so they brought these ideals back, like the ideals of self-government, democracy, uh, things like that. And so that had a lot to do with, you know, why the French Revolution would occur and why they would want reforms. But also don't forget about the Age of Enlightenment that we talked about before. That was another cause of obviously why the revolution happened as well. All right. So um, let me also get into uh, and talk about some other reasons, of course, why the revolution would eventually break out. Uh, there's some other things I haven't really talked about, uh, which um, were, I guess, other reasons why the French Revolution happened. I'm not sure these were listed in here right there. These are kind of still under the causes of the revolution uh, right there uh, on that slide. But um, another major cause of the French Revolution was the lack of equality among the lower classes. They had no rights, politically, socially, ec even economically uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, that had a lot to do with why the reason why the revolution happened, the fact that they wanted more political rights and all that uh, in the country. And uh, they are all part of the so-called ancient regime you see there, uh, which means by ancient regimes means in French the old order, uh, which was the old political social system of France that went all the way back to medieval times, like going back to, I guess, when the Bourbons and these other dynasties in France were going back to the Capetians had been around uh, and all that. Uh, and so uh, under the uh, ancient regime, basically the upper classes pretty much controlled everything, uh, whether it be the, you know, the monarchs that were in power, or the Bourbons or other dynasties that were like the Valois uh, that were in power, the nobility, the clergy, uh, they were the ones that had all the power uh, pretty much uh, in the country. They had all the land. They had all the power. They had all the privileges. They had all the rights to do pretty much anything they want. They controlled the military. They controlled the Catholic Church. Uh, so they didn't pay a whole lot of taxes either. A lot, of, a lot of the nobility, I think, especially by the time of the Bourbons, were kind of exempt you know, from paying, paying taxes, uh, things like that. And a lot of the taxes were still put on like the lower classes, like the peasants and all that. And they had also... Even up to Louis the Sixteenth's time, they still had like some forms of um, of, the, of feudalism still around. It was crazy you know, at that time, but they did. Um, now the uh, so-called ancient regime was divided into really what were three main social classes, uh, which went back to medieval times. Uh, and I don't know if you remember correctly about medieval times. Uh, there was an old joke about what people did like occupation wise. So you had people that basically prayed, you had people that basically um, that fought and then you had people that worked. So you had, that would be obviously the clergy, right? Then you had, of course, the uh, nobility uh, and then obviously the common people, mostly peasants, of course, they are often called in Europe, the estates or the estates of the realm. This is something that's kind of not just in France, it was in like other countries in general, they use this term to describe the different social classes that made up most of the people uh, that are there. And um, primarily uh, the, uh, I'll kind of put it right here, but the, the those are the three main classes, how they broke them down. First, the state was often the clergy, like in the Catholic church, um, pretty much. Second, the state was the nobility, which I guess would be the king and all that too, aristocracy, uh, in general. And then you see the third estate was the so-called common people, like I said, which the French would often call them also the commune, uh, the commons, uh, basically, was what it was. Of course, those first two, first, second estate, they had like pretty much, like I said, all the power uh, in the country, all the privileges. Uh, they paid limited taxes, uh, whereas the third estate paid the majority of the taxes uh, in, in the country. Uh, the third estate was also subdivided too. It had different these different subclasses uh, that were also in it. 
It's where a lot of the different um, class and the middle class kind of evolve over time. Uh, you've got like your upper middle versus your lower middle classes. That's kind of where it came from. Uh, it originated from. And uh, the uh, upper part of the third estate, of course, you see you've got the bourgeoisie, of course. These are like the townspeople's that Marx talks, Karl Marx talks about later, uh, like some of his books, like Communist Manifesto, et cetera, uh, where he talks about how the, the uh, I guess, with the end of feudalism and the rise of the Industrial Revolution, the bourgeoisie eventually become what we call the capitalists that run all the industries and all that, own the factories, the capital and all that. And um, so they're in the upper middle class. Uh, these are people that own like businesses, uh, but they also are a lot, of, a lot of people that are highly educated, professional types, doctors, lawyers, professors, things like that would be kind of considered to be, I guess, in the upper middle class uh, in general. They're often called culottes in French. In, Fran in, Fran in, the, in France, uh, and um, they are called culottes because of the fact that they would often um, wear these pants uh, that went down to the knee. I think they call them knee bridges uh, or something like that. You see a lot of the uh, founding fathers wearing them too, up to like the early 1800s. It was very popular. I thought I had a picture of um, Louis the 16th wearing them, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think I've shown maybe a picture before of, um, I don't know if he's got him or not. Uh, you can't quite see him, but he probably has him on. It goes down about right here around the knee about where it is. Uh, but basically, uh, he he is, you know, pretty much would wear them. I think George Washington wore them too. A lot of the founding fathers, uh, they also wore them uh, also as well. So basically, um that's something you see quite a lot. Uh, then you've got the urban lower class, uh, or classes, I guess they call them sometimes also as well. Uh, they're called sometimes sansculottes. They're kind of like a lower middle class, and these are peoples that uh, are like townspeople as well, but they're obviously sport, uh, poor. They have some kind of skill. Uh, they're not as educated and wealthy. Uh, so if they have education, they might have to buy like a tutor uh, or pay for education that kind of thing. Uh, so both those groups are important, by the way. Those two I just mentioned, of course, uh, right there uh, are pretty important in starting the revolution later. They pretty much are the ones that kind of, you know, were behind it uh, overall. Uh, and um, they really are. They're the ones that, that want it the most because uh, they have, they want more rights politically, socially, economically, uh, and so on. Uh, and so um, they try to fight for that later when the revolution does break out. Oh, the peasants, I forgot about them. That's that third subgroup, of course. That's in the third estate. They made up most of the people of France, I think 26 million or whatever it was uh, they had at the time. So a majority of them, what they wanted was like food. They want to eat. <laughs> That's pretty much what I think was the main thing. They favored cheaper food prices, you know, things like more availability of food. Uh, they wanted to obviously lower the taxes or have hardly any taxes. Um, and then also they wanted to get rid of feudalism. They had all these different feudal ties that they had to pay, like taxes to the nobility. Uh, they had to pay the church tithes to the Catholic church. Uh, so they wanted to get rid of all of these things, basically, uh, to um, have a better life, have more equality, you know, as people. And most of the French were involved in some kind of form of agriculture, you know, in general. All right. Um, now I'm going to get into and talk about, of course, one of the last big things that really caused the revolution to break out. And of course, that is the, it's all because of debts that the, that the French owe. Uh, the, the French owed some crazy amount of debt uh, from the American revolution because they had supported that war uh, against the British on the American side. Uh, and uh, they believe it was one of the main causes of why the French Revolution broke out in July of 1789. And um, you can see they spent something like 1.3 billion livres, is what the kind of money they had back in those days. I guess before they had the franc, I guess. But they had the franc too, I think, as well. But now something like $350 million in today's money that they had spent uh, on the war. Uh, I think the British had kind of a similar debt that they had uh, from the 
the war itself, I think theirs as well. They had a bunch of debt they had to that they had to pay off later uh, as well. And so what happened was the king of France, who, of course, Louis XVI, uh, we were talking about uh, previously, was forced to call what they call the Estates General. I think I've got a picture of the Estates General somewhere, uh, which is, um, I'm not sure what I did with it right here. I thought I had a picture of it somewhere. Uh, that's not it. That's somewhere. But uh, anyway, but that, that, uh, the Estates General, I'll kind of get into uh, and talk about uh, what that was. Yeah, they had this impending uh, bankruptcy where the country, you know, they had to raise revenue, which obviously meant raising taxes in general to you know, pay for all the debts they owed uh, from the war. The Estates General was France's legislative assembly uh, that went back to medieval times. Uh, and um, I think it was founded in the 14th century is where it went back to uh, the Estates General. Uh, didn't really have the same authority as the English Parliament had, where they could create laws and tax revenue and things like that. Uh, but it hadn't met since uh, really Louis the Thirteenth's reign, because uh, under Louis the Thirteenth, you know, they went to absolutism, and so they basically didn't really use it. Primarily, it was used as an advisory body of the king, like you know, they would advise advise him on certain things, which could be physical things, not just political. But they really didn't have any real vote or say. Yeah, well, they had a vote, but it didn't really have a say on much on, you know, what they could officially create laws or acts. Uh, and so the king basically uh, had a bunch of delegates that they elected to it, which eventually arrived in the spring of 1789. About 1,200 uh, members or delegates arrived at Versailles, I think around, I want to say May, I think it was May of 1789, and they represented all the different estates, the so-called estates or estates of the realm uh, in France. That's why they call it estates general, because it represented the three estates. Uh, and um, any, anyway, what happened was the reason why the revolution politically started in France was because the uh, third estate and, of course, the monarchy like Louis XVI and his advisors couldn't basically decide how they should vote like some kind of voting method to decide, you know, I guess if there's going to be any tax revenue uh, that they'll kind of vote on. Uh, and so what happened was the um, third estate wanted to vote per delegate, like per representative, I guess is maybe kind of what it was, but they really weren't voting by delegate. They were really voting by the state, which is how it used to work. I think going back to medieval times, it's just that the first and second estates would often just outvote the third estate, you know, two to one, because they're the upper classes. And so that's what the king wanted and his advisors. They wanted to basically just vote by, you know, order, first estate, second estate, third estate, uh, and just be done with it, like a formality or something like that. And then they just raise taxes. Uh, and uh, But uh, what happened was um, they had this uh, man named Abby Siez, who I kind of blow up right here. Uh, also known as Emmanuel Siez, who was a Catholic uh, priest. Uh, he was also a, a, an abbey who ran like a monastery. And he wrote this uh, popular pamphlet at the time that was called What is the Third Estate? Came out, I think, in the early part of 1789, January or February, I think, is when it, he published it. Took off and um, it became real, real popular with the, with the Third Estate. Uh, and with the you know peasants and all that and, and other other lower classes, and uh, in the actual pamphlet, uh, C has attacked the upper class as having like too much power, too much privileges uh, in the country, and uh, what Abby C has wanted, he believed that the third estate ought to form their own assembly, like a real democratic assembly, because the third estate represented the majority of the people. I think ninety something percent the population of France was in the third estate. So they want this assembly that would represent everybody, not just like the upper classes uh, in general. And so that's that's the reason why, you know, Abbey C has attacked basically, you know, uh, the upper class and all the powers and privileges, you know, uh, that they had. Um, so that's basically, you know, what the third estate was. And um, 
I think it had like a bunch of questions in it, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which I think I have. I think I've got um, right here. Uh, the first question was, that, what is the third estate? Everything. That was the famous uh, answer. What has it been uh, up to or what has it been here to for in the political order? Nothing. What does it demand to become something? Um, so, so that's basically his ideas, uh, Abby Sias. And Abby Sias would end up being, you know, one of the first, I guess, revolutionaries during the French Revolution to really hear about. He was kind of involved in it. Uh, and so uh, you'll see it eventually. It'll kind of come to fruition with a bunch of things that happen next, of course, with the revolution. And, of course, after that occurred with the you know popularity of, of, of basically the uh, – uh, that pamphlet being published, uh, what occurred was the third estate decided that they were just going to break away uh, and form, like I said, a new assembly uh, at that point. That became the so-called National Assembly, they believe, that formed on June 17, 1789. It was a revolutionary assembly uh, that formed at the beginning of the revolution. And by the way, it was considered one of the first democratic assemblies that the French would really have. Well, they had, of course, a lot of these different versions of it. So I think the term national assembly has been used a lot for a lot of their legislative bodies. Uh, and um, they think it also ended absolutism uh, because of the fact that it became this democratic legislative body. Uh, and so I think at that point, that is when pretty much the whole French, French Revolution politically starts, like ruling at that point. Not the violence of it, like from, like behind me, but uh, eventually it's going to come to fruition in a couple weeks uh, after they start making these, you know, changes to the country. Uh, and uh, there's a famous incident where they, uh, what happened was they then, uh, of course, after they went and they formed the the so-called um, National Assembly, they eventually then three days later they took this oath all the delegates of it, which, by the way, included some of the first, second estate did join them. But they took an oath called the Tennis Court Oath to basically take an oath that they would create a constitution for France, uh, like a Democratic-type Democrat you know, uh, constitution. Uh, and so uh, they all made a promise uh, to, to basically do that, uh, which eventually they would do. Uh, and... Um, of course, it's been depicted in various drawings and paintings. Here's one, I guess, that's been colorized. I think the original one was like a drawing uh, that was done by a famous uh, French painter, uh, Jacques Louis David. Uh, he's, of course, very well known um, artist. He's done a lot of done a lot of different paintings. Uh, Jacques Louis David. Uh, he, of course, neoclassical French painter that kind of lived between the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, he, of course, had that drawing, but he's done a lot of paintings of, like, the French Revolution, uh, of course. He's also done, like, a lot of paintings of Napoleon, like Napoleon crossing the Alps, um, Greek and Roman history also as well, like the death of Maras, big, I know, to the French Revolution, Napoleon crossing the Alps, uh, death of Socrates, they've heard of that one uh, in ancient Greece. Rape of the Sabine Women, I think, is another one that he's also uh, well known uh, as well. I think my favorite is my favorite painting of his is the Napoleon crossing the Alps. That's I kind of use that sometimes as a symbol or whatever, but uh, that's one of my favorite paintings, by the way. But um, anyway, um, so so yeah, that's that's pretty much the the thing that's going to really you know lead into uh, the the French the French Revolution and what's going to happen eventually, as you know is that because of what occurs, you know, with with that that incident with the forming of the National Assembly, that's going to lead into a revolution becoming more violent, uh, which which will, you know, see the storming of the Bastille. That's going to be like behind me. That's the Bastille right there. Uh, that's going to end up, of course, being one of the things that really uh, ends up, you know, being a big, big cause uh, of why, uh, you know, the, the revolution, of course, occurs. Now, I'm going to talk. I've got a few minutes left. I can kind of go ahead and talk about that a little bit, about uh, the kind of the outbreak of the revolution, like the violence of it with the French Revolution. 
uh, breaking out with the storming of the Bastille uh, and all that. Well, the Bastille kind of get into uh, what that was, of course. Um, by the way, here's a picture, by the way, showing the uh, amount of delegates that were involved in the so-called tennis court oath. 578 took the oath. And that's the oath, by the way, they took on June 20th. National Assembly centering that it has been summoned to establish the Constitution of the Kingdom, decrees that all members of this assembly shall immediately take a solemn oath not to separate until the Constitution of the Kingdom is established on firm foundations. So, yeah, that's something that they would do, which I think would take them about a year or two, uh, of course, develop, uh, of course, that, you know, a new constitution, of course, that would occur. So, but I'm going to get to, of course, the big thing, of course, that happens, you know, which is the so-called storming of the Bastille, of course, that that happens uh, in July. Uh, well, um, why did they storm it? What's the deal? And, of course, what's, what's up with the Bastille? Well, we've talked about it before, right? The Bastille, remember, was this famous political prison of the Bourbons uh, and um, it was a symbol of tyranny. Uh, you know, if you were against the regime, they would also often imprison you. Remember Voltaire, I think, was imprisoned there twice. Marquis de La, I think it was Marquis de Sade, La Sade, yeah, Marquis de Sade, I think, was famous for being imprisoned there as well. Uh, and other, other famous people were put in there. Pretty much the king could pretty much do whatever they want with you, like the man in the iron mask, just imprison you for no cause uh, overall. Uh, and so it was a symbol of, you know, absolutism, tyranny you know, of the Bourbons. Uh, and so that's part of why they stormed it uh, was was that, you know, because in the fact that they had weapons, there were weapons inside, like, you know, gunpowder, cannon, and, and, you know, rifles that they could use against the, you know, the regime. Uh, but um, there was this other incident that was very famous where apparently there was this man named Jacques Necker who was actually Swiss French, uh, who was an important finance minister under Louis XVI. And he was one of the very few ministers under uh, Louis XVI's government that wanted to make reforms. I think he wanted to raise taxes mostly on the upper class, which most of the lower class favored. Uh, and uh, But he fired him, fired the guy. Uh, and so after they fired Necker, uh, they thought that what was going to happen next was that they were going to close down the National Assembly and pretty much in the revolution, like crush it uh, overall. It's probably what would happen if Louis XIV would have been the king. Imagine he was a pretty staunch ruler. Uh, but Louis XVI, you know, was this ruler that was, you know, like I said, weak. Uh, and so what happened was the, the Bastille was stormed by French citizens, uh, maybe with some for, uh, forces that joined up with them, like troops. Uh, and uh, the Bastille only had about 114 guards that were actually guarding it uh, when it happened on July 14th, 1789. And the guy guarding it, the governor of the Bastille, his name was Marquis de Launay. He was just overwhelmed. He couldn't stop him. There's just too many people. And he was actually one of the first people to be killed in the revolution. They killed him and they cut his head off. They put it on pike. Uh, and so, so they stormed it. And uh, I think there were only like a few people actually in it that were prisoners. I want to say six or seven, I think, were in it. But um, the French later, you know, were so mad about the Bastille and all that and the regime that they later tore it down, like stone by stone, uh, which is, of course, true about that. And I think people took home parts of the Bastille as like a souvenir uh, later. I think now it's just a park there where it was, of course, uh, originally. Uh, as you know, uh, later what happened was they made a holiday out of it, which, of course, uh, is very famous, uh, which I think in 1880, that's when uh, so-called Bastille Day, you know, as they call it now, you know, became like a national holiday uh, of, of the French, uh, celebrated every July 14th. Uh, it's kind of like our July 4th Independence Day in the United States. It's kind of similar. People have parades and things like that. And France, they have like big military parades and things like that. So very patriotic, I guess, uh, on that day. But they're, they're celebrating uh, the overthrow of like the absolutism, I guess, you know, the bourbons at the time, uh, at least the beginning of it. Uh, and But it's also a kind of a celebration of the French people being united, you know, you know, 
you know, overthrowing this regime uh, in, in general. Oh, and you can see the guy that made it into a holiday, Benjamin Raspail. He was the one who actually uh, came up with the idea uh, for it, where it was approved uh, later on. This is under later under the French Republic um, that you have. So that's that's basically, you know, how the, how the French Revolution pretty much broke out. Uh, I'll, of course, get later into uh, discussing, you know, how the French how the French Revolution kind of goes. It's going to, of course, go through different stages. You're going to see uh, after the revolutionaries start taking over the government, uh, they'll start making reforms, um, you know, to the state, uh, which I think are kind of moderate initially uh, at first. And then later, what's going to happen, the Jacobins basically start taking over who are more radical uh, and they, they go crazy. They start cutting people's heads off with the guillotine uh, left left and right. That's when the revolution gets really, really bloody. Uh, if you know about that. Then there's a reaction against Robespierre and the Jacobins and they're overthrown. Uh, and then later they have uh, Napoleon seize power. He's going to take over uh, the country and bring the monarchy back in later with the empire of France, of course, when he's emperor and all that. But um, by the way, what was Louis the 16th reaction to the revolution breaking out? Well, one of his advisors came into him and said, sire, they've stormed the Bastille. Uh, and, and of course, uh, what Louis the 16th thinking, he asked him, is it a revolt? And of course, the advisors tells him something like, no, sire, it's a revolution. Uh, is what it is. <laughs> so he was really kind of like not kind of not really know, know what was kind of going on, you know, when this, of course, happens. And, of course, I'll get to it later. They later storm also Versailles. They'll storm that, too, uh, later at the end of the year. Uh, they'll storm that, and they'll force them to live in Paris, uh, Louis the Sixteenth and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Eventually, they kind of become like figureheads that eventually get overthrown and get their heads chopped off, uh, which I'll get to later about that. So that's pretty much it uh, on the French Revolution, like this part one lecture. Of course, later, like I said, on Thursday, I'll continue with a part two uh, lecture on the French Revolution. I should have time to kind of get into uh, and also talk about um, Napoleon you know, a little bit uh, as well. And uh, don't forget, uh, if you have any have any questions, you know, about uh, this lecture, uh, let me let me know. Uh, you know, just you know, I guess there are no questions right now. Looks like it, but um, later on in my channel, if you got a question about the French Revolution or any other lecture, of course, in the past, uh, let me know. You do get bonus for it, students, of course, for of course comments, questions, etc. So y'all take care. Uh, y'all, of course, have a great rest rest of the week. Uh, don't forget about those assignments due uh, this week. Uh, of course, the one on British history. I think it's Canvas number Canvas quiz number four. I think it is right. And then you got the vocab due. The second vocab is due Friday uh, as well later in the week. So y'all take care and have a great uh, rest of the week.